So the pendulum is one of our favorite problems in physics, and we're going to treat it with the Lagrangian methods. Uh, the basic idea of a pendulum is that you have a bob here connected to an arm. This end is fixed. Usually you do this in a uniform gravitational field. You could also do it uh, in a 1 over r squared gravitational field, which would be fun to try out. Usually you start a pendulum with what's called the small angle approximation, where you don't let it get too far up in terms of its angle. Uh, the angle that we're interested in is going to be usually measured from the, from the vertical line. It doesn't really matter. I mean, it's the same physics regardless. But if that's the case, you get something that looks pretty close to a sine curve, right? So here I'm looking at the angular velocity as a function of time. Uh, yeah, yeah, angular velocity positive and negative because angular velocity as a vector in this case is going to point either into the screen or out of the screen. Uh, and that's how we turn it into a vector is it gives you the, the rotation there based on the right hand rule. And so that's why it's going from positive to negative. What else can we graph with this? We can also graph, I mean, we can graph the position Cartesian coordinates. That's, it's interesting. It's not terribly insightful because really this is an example of a constrained system because X and Y are not moving independently, right? They're both determined by the angle theta here that you make with the vertical. And so this is an example of a constraint system where, yeah, it's moving in two dimensions, but it's really a one dimensional problem because that angle in here is really the only variable that matters, right? X and Y are both functions of theta. So you might as well just cut through those and study theta anyway. I mean, obviously they're going to oscillate X and Y, right? Because the angle is oscillating. So what you're seeing is a sine and cosine of a function of time right which is interesting uh what else can we study with this uh, we could also look at the magnitude of the speed here which is interesting because obviously it's going to have a dramatic turnaround when it gets to the edges there because speed has to be positive interesting to look at uh you can also look at the acceleration of this thing right now that's interesting because uh our acceleration we've got a high maximum minimum and then a low maximum where is it reaching each of those points let's maybe investigate that for a second with the acceleration this is of course the magnitude of the acceleration vector so we get let's turn down our simulation speed there we go so we get a small minimum down here at the bottom of the swing it looks like and then i get a big maximum out here at the edge so i've got a whole lot of acceleration out here at the edge not and, and and excuse me a a local maximum not a global maximum but a local maximum here at the bottom of the swing right and that's interesting because usually we compare this to the motion of a spring but a spring acceleration magnitude is not going to do that for a spring the acceleration magnitude is going to go uh, let's see it's going to be maximum at the edges just like you have here, but it's not going to have this little blip in the middle here, right? So that's already a difference between this and a spring setup, right? We sometimes call this harmonic motion, and it's really, it's only approximated as harmonic motion. That's why we're going to treat it with a full-fledged uh, Lagrangian approach here. Uh, let's see, I wonder if that peak is a function of the small angle approximation that we so often make. So I'm going to grab the drag tool going to get this thing up in amplitude a bit more. Let's get it released from a higher angle. Uh, and then we'll need to clear this because I've, I've now messed up the acceleration data by grabbing it. Oh yeah, that's really interesting. So now I get a very high peak in the middle and I get basically nothing at the end. Cool. So we get a, let's see what happens at the edge point. So at the edge of the motion, at, at the at the height of the swing, we get a maximum in the acceleration magnitude. Then we get a minimum somewhere about here, kind of halfway from the maximum to the bottom part of the swing. And then we get another maximum right here at the bottom of the swing. That's interesting because that's not something that happens with a spring, right? Because with the spring, you would have maximum acceleration at the endpoints and zero acceleration or minimum acceleration at the uh, at the equilibrium point. So that's interesting. Here we're getting, yep, we're getting a minimum there, kind of halfway to the maximum. 
All right, we're at the peak of the swing now and we get a peak in acceleration. So that's interesting because the acceleration's oscillating with twice the frequency of the actual pendulum oscillations. That's interesting. All right, that'll be something to look out for when we do our study of this. Uh, what else can we take a look at? Uh, force magnitude should go just like the acceleration, right? Let's see, so we'll get a maximum there in the middle, minimum, and then a maximum out at the end, maximum at the bottom, maximum at the edge. Yep, yep, okay, that tracks, that tracks, good. Uh, let's see, why don't we try this thing's angular momentum, since it's rotating makes sense to think of its angular momentum. Again, it's gonna be positive or negative depending on which uh, way it's rotating, clockwise or counterclockwise. Yeah, that looks like, looks like it's oscillating. Of course, the interesting part is what happens when we go to large angles. So let's try putting this thing pretty close to 90 degrees. Okay, good, good. You notice it's getting a lot sharper. Like that, this region in here way too sharp to be a traditional sine curve, right? So if I go to, let's try acceleration magnitude now, see what that's doing. All right, I get a minimum, ooh, look at that. The, I get a maximum there in the middle, and now my max out at the end is getting much less, right? Because of the way those torques are, well, I guess, yeah, no, excuse me, we're looking at acceleration. The way those forces are combining, uh, we're not getting as much acceleration there at the end point as we are boop, here in the middle point. So that's pretty cool. Uh, let's see, can I get angular acceleration? No, we don't have that. Okay, let's try angular velocity again. Yeah, you see how before it was this nice sine curve, this is too straight to be a sine, right? Sine is supposed to be a bit more uh, it's supposed to be a little bit curvier than that. And so we're not getting a traditional sine curve anymore. We've gone past the small angle approximation. All right, I might regret this, but let's take a look at the energy. So let's take a look at kinetic energy sum, potential energy sum. Of course, those are gonna go opposite of each other because you're trading energy back and forth. If I look at the total energy, it's fairly constant. There's a little bit of a wiggle to it just because of the numerical calculation that's going on in the background here in the simulation. Um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're always gonna have that, right? The, the only way you can fix that is to get a better approximation method, basically. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, this will be great to analyze.